Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Gabrielle Arruda. I'm the owner and director of Philosophy Arts. We're a contemporary art gallery based in New York. We're also a progressive education space dedicated to um, advancing the role of philosophy in contemporary art. Tonight, we are here to celebrate the birthday of Anthony Hayden Guest, who's turned 84 today. Congratulations, Anthony. Um, we just popped some bubbly. Um, we have with us tonight the Director of Philosophical Praxis from uh, Philosophy Arts, Donovan Irvin, who's with us live in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I was going to say you were in Toledo, Ohio, but that's not true at all. Oh, um, no, that's false. And, <laughs> not where you live. And we also have with us uh, art dealer, uh, Korsh Mabubian, who is live from a bathtub in the West Village. Korsh, hello. 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 I'm very clean. Okay. Um, and we have also uh, Anthony Hayden Guest, the man of the hour. So we're going to spend some time now um, looking at his life, telling stories, um, asking him questions about what his inspirations were, and looking at some of the work from the latest show, and then we'll be um, celebrating with the rest of you. We'll have more faces on the screen later. Um, so to begin, the biography of Anthony. You know Anthony as a writer, a cartoonist, an art critic, a poet, a socialite, bon vivant, often described as. He's written several books and written for many major magazines. He was born in Paris, grew up in London, and has long lived in New York City. Um, Donovan, you have spent plenty of time talking to Anthony over the last few months uh, in the midst of our projects. You've interviewed him and written about him. Could you tell us a little bit about your perspective um, through a philosophical lens about Anthony's life and his uh, achievements in art? Yeah, I, I asked uh, Anthony this impossibly like general question. I always like trick people with these big you know, like, well, define art and that kind of crap, you know, that they, you know. So, so Anthony, like, pretty much straight away answered me that humor is as a, a type of survival mechanism, or it comes out of an instinct for self-preservation in a way. Um, so I think we'll see that a lot, this sort of a distance that he tries to generate between himself and the subject to take a different angle on it and say, oh, isn't that sort of, like, interesting, even when that subject is himself, I think, in some of the dangerous situations that Anthony sometimes finds himself in, uh, the same idea happens. You get a little dissociation and distance from the self and say, oh, uh, what an <laughs> interesting situation that I found myself in. But out of that uh, sort of observational space springs this humor uh, that I think he brings to his work in various genres. So I'm uh, interested to hear him tell us some of those stories. Um, this reminds me that I have forgotten what we were going to do in the beginning. Oh, did you do it? Well, as I, you know, when I first came to New York, um, behaviorism was all, all, the, all the, the thing in psychology or social, and sociology, I think. I met one of the masters of it. I was at New York Magazine. I said, what's behaviorism? He said, there's two little girls walking along the beach great wave springs up and dashes them both down. One gets up crying, one gets up laughing. That's what behaviorism is about. And I realized I was one of the ones that basically got up laughing. That's it. It's wonderful. I, I regularly find myself chuckling at things which are just ordinary procedural things in life. If I've done something wrong, something which is not infrequent, I tend to laugh about it. Speaking of which, we were going to play a, a little game in the beginning of the presentation, which our, we provided our own comic relief instead. Um, but we're going to do that first, um, because there's a lot about Anthony's life that we, we can't cover everything, of course. Um, and there are some important moments, though, that we thought we could kind of highlight on. And um, some are difficult to, to process and have been, been tragic, but have shaped Anthony's life. And we thought we'd turn it into a little bit of a, an absurdist game um, to, since we are celebrating a humorist. So we're gonna play a game of two truths and a lie. So I am going to read off three statements about events that have happened in Anthony's life. And uh, one of them is a lie. So in the chat bo bo uh, box, you can comment to let us know which you think is true and which you think is a lie. So Donovan, can you monitor that to see what people are saying? 
Absurd yeah, responses are welcome. Um, okay, at number one, as a young child, Anthony spent 18 months imprisoned in a Vichy internment camp in France. He was there with his mother who eventually plotted an escape and got her and her young son out. Number two, Anthony performed on stage at the Isle of Wight Rock Festival in 1970, Britain's own counterculture equivalent of Woodstock. And number three, Anthony joined Iggy Pop live on stage at the Whiskey A Go-Go in 1975 when Iggy Pop famously rolled around on stage on broken bottles. So which of these events is the lie? Was Anthony in an internment camp in France as a child? Was he performing on stage at the Isle of Wight concert? Or was he with Iggy Pop uh, or was the lie? Uh, how do I? Uh, or was he with Iggy Pop on stage, rolling in broken glass? We have uh, several votes for number one from mm -hmm. Anastasia, Lisa, uh, Sherwin Harris, the, uh, Gene Seidman. They're all saying number one. A couple of votes for number three from Roger D. Cabral. Um, a couple of people are saying Iggy Pop, Ellen Jong. Uh, Stephen Delaro, they're saying the Iggy Pop one is the lie. Hey, Steve. Um, so, okay, Anthony, do you want to tell us which is the lie? Yeah, it's not correct. I was on stage with Iggy Pop, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> you were there. I was, okay. I was in the audience, so 1975, Whiskey on Go Go. Iggy <laughs> rolled it over on broken bottles, but I, I was prevented from joining him on stage. That is a lie, too. I didn't try. <laughs> nice. Um, well, we will discuss, discuss some of those other bits. But you, so you performed at the Isle of Wight uh, Festival. Yeah, I read, I read a, one of, an early rhyme, uh, very courageously attacking the Vietnam War. Nice. Apropos. Full of fame of all sent products to the front. IBM sent us a brain. Playboy sent. I won't finish that last line. Um, and we will discuss, so it is true that you were, you and your mother were imprisoned in a Vichy internment camp during your youth. And, and we will discuss that a little bit more shortly. Correct. My mother was based in Marseille, was with an organization trying to get um, allied people, Brits and others, out of, out of uh, occupied France and Vichy France. And was caught and we went to... Uh, where the devil was it? Besançon. I think it was Besançon. We went to a camp, a German camp in Besançon, and she escaped with me. And um, I remember of this. I remember what the beds looked like in the camp. That's all. I remember what a child that age would remember. Sure. Okay, we have another round of two truths and a lie. Um, in number one. In the 1990s, Andy, uh, Andy, excuse me, in the 1990s, Anthony was thrown into the trunk of a car and kidnapped in Beirut by an angry family of drug lords. He was subsequently rescued and released by a much friendlier family of hashish dealers. Number two, in 1977, through his friendship with Malcolm McLaren, Anthony helped pen the lyrics to the Sex Pistols song, Anarchy in the UK. And number three, in 1996, Anthony and his girlfriend were violently attacked by a stranger in his home. The man stabbed Anthony 14 times before Anthony was able to subdue him with a blow to the head from a shillelagh. Which of these statements is a lie? We have some people who began chiming in that number one was true almost right away. Uh, so we, then we have Roger de Cabral, Nin Bruderman saying that two is false. We have then people, I think, as you read through them, got the three, uh, affirming that three is true. Evie Stevenson, Makar. Someone wants to know what a shillelagh is. So for those of you who don't know, it's an Irish club. It's a walking stick with a big, heavy ball at the end. Yeah. Lisa Levy, Evie Stevenson, and Layla Love say two is a lie. OK. So and Anthony? Also says, which, which is the first to get? The first is about Beirut. Yeah, that, that is correct. I was uh, kidnapped outside a hotel called a, a restaurant called the Chalet Suisse and thrown to the back of a car because I'd gone into Lebanon with a um, former major, you know, drug smuggler. But uh, what I did not know is he was working for the DEA, take me over, we were working on a project 
and they were angry. They assumed I was in that business. And he owed uh, this this particular gang. He owed the money. It was a kind of a rather a. And then I was actually rescued by the family, who were the major hashish people in Lebanon, who were basically my protectors there. That is true. What's the second one again? The second one was about the Sex Pistols song. No, no. I, I, it, I ended that it's ten percent of that is true. <laughs> uh, um, I interviewed Malcolm McLaren uh, pre-punk because I was doing a piece for a magazine about how T-shirts were becoming a real language. You know, back in the day, if you wore a T-shirt with Coca-Cola on it, it meant you worked for the Coca-Cola company. It only became a kind of the language of T-shirts only began at a specific moment. So then when punk began, um, and I lived on the King's Road in the Pheasantry, and Malcolm and Vivian Westwood had opened their store just up the street. And I popped in and, um, you know, we were friendly, so I thought. There was a T-shirt there. It's a famous T-shirt. A lot of dead punks were photographed in that T-shirt, Johnny Thunders, uh, with a lot of names on it. And on the left, I saw my name under, under people not to wake up next to. And I said, Malcolm, what's this? He said, well, you're an old hippie, aren't you? What was the third one? The third one was the stabbing incident. Oh, totally true. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Brutal. We can discuss that later um, as it, as it uh, has had an impact on your love of dancing. Um, so yeah. we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. So a uh, little game of two truths and a lie. Our objective in, in having this series called Disclosures in Dialogue through Dialogue is to keep these to 30 minutes. That is clearly not, <laughs> we haven't hit that goal tonight. Um, so we will we'll continue. Formative experiences in Anthony's life. Um, so here we have a picture of Anthony at four years old in Marseille and a photo of uh, him and his mother um, from, I guess, roughly around the same time. Uh, Anthony, you want to tell us about... Um... Yeah, I'm familiar with that picture. And my memory is, uh, after Escape, where she got back over the... We, we I mean, I, with my system, she got back into first into Portugal. And I do remember a few little things in Portugal. I remember jumping off a cement block, then got back to London. And then, of course, there was a lot of stuff in the papers. And my memory is that she was recapitulating our escape, crawling under the wire. And this was probably, I think, sort of showing what that was like. Mm. Uh, that's what I grew up thinking that photograph was about anyway. Oh. Okay, and then this um, is uh, some images we found of uh, the, the camp, uh, a picture of the camp. Um, before it was turned into housing in 2006 in France. And then we found an illustration also of the, the barracks for the women um, there. Pictures of the beds. What's that, Korsh? We have pictures of the beds. Anthony remembers the beds. Yeah, I don't remember the beds like that, though. I remember them as bunk beds. With, I remember vividly that they were about three-story beds. Uh, and I remember there was straw and there were what I would now call military type blankets. There were gray blankets or green blankets. That's a, that's a childhood memory. Um, yeah. This Charlie Chaplin uh, quote um, we thought was applicable to the story, to truly laugh, you must be able to take your pain and play with it. Um, does that resonate with you, Anthony? It's completely instinctual. I, I tend to see the funny side of things. It's not, it's not a strategy, it's not something I consciously do. It's just my nature. Well, we're appreciative of that. Um, so Donovan, what is our, well, it's here, humor as a survival strategy. Would you, you touched upon it earlier, um, but this is our philosophical concept for this um, episode. Uh, would you like to unpack that for us, please? Yeah, so I think that part of what humor allow, can allow us to do is again, it's the different uh, the distance that you can get from something so humor can allow you to sort of sit with it a little more coolly a little more collectedly and uh take it in and observe it whereas if you were feeling it sort of like more directly or viscerally it would be 
perhaps a bit more traumatic or something that you would want to recoil from. Uh, so I think this uh, ability to gain, I don't want to say an objective view, but uh, a position from which you can observe an event and laugh at it as a kind of, you know, sort of therapeutically. Because um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the cartoons in Anthony's recent series have been about sort of social ills or different foibles uh, between people, uh, different uh, problems that have to do with like celebrity culture or social media and uh, sort of pokes uh, uh, fun at them as well. So it's, you know, um, yeah, to analyze the, the negative aspects and provide a sort of solution or humorous uh, approach to it. Korish, would you like to chime in also? I know this is something personal to you as well. I grew up studying Jewish humor, um, not because of my religion, but just seeing it around me. And of course, I had my share of difficult moments uh, in childhood. And uh, I think there's a complexity to the humor. It, it, it's not always about what's directly in your face. It's not about lampooning something. You'll see some of the images I picked uh, for illustrations further down in this presentation um, were not necessarily very funny, but to me they are. And, and we take ourselves to an imaginary place where we can stand outside of reality and, and laugh at the world and laugh at one concept, one small part of it. And I think this humor as a survival strategy has so many different layers to it. Um, and Anthony captures so many of them in his cartoons it would be impossible to just, you know, sort of summarize it in a sentence, but to call it a survival strategy is accurate. Great, thanks. So we're looking back now at some influences throughout Anthony's life that has shaped him uh, as an artist and as an art critic. And oh. so one of these is um, the role of Punch Magazine in the young life of, of Anthony. Anthony, you wanna tell us about your experiences of first encountering this periodical? Yeah, we're looking at a very, very ancient copy of Punch there. Uh, the punch, I, 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 that's, probably, that's, probably a 19, that's probably a 19th century Punch, by the look yes, of it. it is. I remember it as a magazine with a shiny cover. And uh, to tell you the truth, the New Yorker was funnier. But I didn't, I didn't know the New Yorker then. And um, yeah, you know, I think uh, Einstein says somewhere that I, they said, I'm what, really a wise guy. Well, well that's... <laughs> Very knowledgeable of me to say that. But he said that two vital human characteristics in and criticism. And I think um, humor arises out of a constant degree of self criticism, really. And, um, you know, one has a constant dialogue with oneself. It's completely instinctual. Anthony, the audio cut out for a second. Did you say humor arises out of self criticism? Is that, that's what I heard? Well, I, I, it's, it's got a lot to do with that. Uh, or oh, oh, criticism, no, criticism anyway. I, I don't mean criticism in as the word criticism tends to mean something hostile. I, I don't mean it. Uh, maybe judgment, you know, some kind of evaluation rather than critique. And it's a constant thought process. One, so, one subjects everything to, to, it's a totally a way of thinking that you tend to analyze almost everything. Um, so then uh, you wanted us to uh, look at some sculptures uh, by Daumier. What, when did you first encounter these? Well, I knew Daumier from, from you know, very young because, um, you know, Daumier prints were very, in London there was a lot of people loved early prints and Daumier was huge. And Daumier I think is a remarkable figure because he's one of the, he really is a crossover figure between art and cartooning because he's a, he's a fabulous artist manually, but also it's also very funny and, and successful humor is very rare to accomplish in art, especially American art. The Europeans are better at it. Bet. Um, and Gustave Doré, I was unfamiliar with this artist. And uh, when did you first encounter uh, his work? Again, again, early, Adolescence, when one encounters so much, you know. Um, your visits to museums or textbooks? Um, not textbooks, no. Um, print shops, 
museums. Uh, Doré was a, you know, he wrote, he was not a funny artist whatsoever. He did things about the Inferno, things like that. But there's a lot of narrative in the work. There's a lot of story. You know, there's lots to take in. Yeah. I like to work enormously. And then moving on to Aubrey Beardsley. Well, this is an artist who's had a big impact on you, correct? When I was a bit older, um, I started looking at art and saying, hey, this is pretty good stuff. But, you know, Leonardo, Rubens, etc. everybody knew about them. You know, they were in the museums. Beardsley, I kind of discovered. Back then, uh, Beardsley contributed to, most famously, for a magazine called The Yellow Book, published in the 1890s. Uh, back then, I, I bought copies, old copies of The Yellow Book for, for about five shillings in London. I think five shillings, maybe five pounds, but I think five shillings. It's a long time ago. And I was completely knocked out. Again, I mean, obviously, they're incredibly good. But they tell a lot of story. And um, I just loved that work. Um, the 1890s was an incredible period. The decadence. I guess I always liked decadence. It's carried through in a, in a, in a number of ways yeah. and served you well. Um, it's a number of people. Donovan, if you could uh, monitor the chat a little bit, a number of people are commenting. So if we can kind of engage with them a little bit more. But yeah. when I touch the button, it makes the PowerPoint stop working. Oh, um, nice. Uh, moving on to John Tenniel. Well, you know, Tenniel, of course, is best known for as the illustrator to Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. And um, it's a rare example of an illustrator whose works have become really synonymous with, the, with what, what they... When one thinks about Alice, you think of the Tenniel illustrations as much as you do of the books. And it's very, I bet they're very unusual. Um, there was a period in late Victorian art when um, it was pre-surrealist, but it had a lot of surrealist energy and it had some of that dream energy. And of, course, of course, you chose these images rather than... Um... Yeah, I was going to comment on that. Uh, um, it was a very personal decision. I love Alice in Wonderland. It's one of my favorite books. And I love Tenniel's illustrations for that book, but I also felt that everyone knows those illustrations. And they're somewhat lamp, I mean, it's a, it's a satire, it's a they're lampooning society. Um, but I think back to my childhood looking through books and uh, wanting to find images because, you know, I wasn't interested in, in reading grown up books, but you flip through the pages and know oh, there's a picture, let's see what's there. And, and to me, this is the kind of thing that would have caught my attention that you're looking at a picture and it, and it shows you something very interesting. These are, these are more complex. They are very funny to me, but funny in, in not a ha-ha lampoon way. You look at the, the knight, he's fat. He's got this bushy mustache. He's kind of, you know, he's as big as the horse. And that caricature makes it unusual, makes it, you, you start questioning it, you start thinking, well, you know, this is sort of a, a funny looking knight. He doesn't look serious. He doesn't look menacing. Um, likewise, uh, the best of friends must part. And you're, and you're wondering, you know, why are these people dressed that way? And, and, and what is that Indian headdress with a Victorian skirt? And uh, they're unusual images. They're serious, but, but they're imaginative and somewhat fantasy. And, and you start laughing at society for coming up with these thoughts. It, it just plays with your mind a little bit. I found these to be really rewarding to look at. And, and I, I love Taniel's work. I love Alice in Wonderland in particular. I wanted to show something completely different this time. Great, thanks for uh, showing us something new. Um, and Ronald Searle, um, who I was also not familiar with. Uh, Anthony, you wanna tell us a little bit about um, how you came upon his work? Well, Ronald Searle was, was a leading British cartoonist when I, when I was growing up, and, um, and he's actually best known for uh, some cartoons about a, a school, about a, school a, a girls' school, or some Trinians, School of Very Naughty Girls. And um, he, he was, he, like Charles Adams in America, um, created a whole world that people happily inhabited. 
And um, this is a time which I, I'd like to, growing up, the world of cartoonery was vast and very popular. America, it was wonderful in America. And you had um, things like Crazy Cat, which um, the avant-garde loved them. Um, it was very close to the art world. The world not the art. Uh, Windsor McKay, Little Nemo and Slumberland, all these. I don't know what, partly I think the, the rise of the still photograph killed it. Well, the still photographs now basically it's gone, but thanks to iPhones, it's lost its magic. But the glory of cartoonery has not yet been restored, but it will be. You're working on it. Uh, so we're moving on to the, the glory. Before you move on, Gabrielle, yes. you, you came across the cholera lines image uh, in your own research of, of, of images to include tonight. And I, I'm wondering, you know, what made you pick that one? Um, well, I enjoy the, the research aspect of, you know, uncovering artists that, you know, haven't otherwise been on my radar or in my, you know, education. Um, and so in, in digging about him, I, I immediately sort of discovered that he had been a prisoner of war for many years um, in, uh, in, I think it was in Singapore. He was, was in a, Malaya, I think it was Malaya. It was, some, it was somewhere uh, in a J Japanese uh, camp. And, um, and he thought he was going to die and he clung on to um, his humanity um, by hiding scraps of paper that he would draw on um, and, and putting them under the beds of the, the dying cholera patients um, in the makeshift uh, infirmary uh, within the POW camp. And upon um, his release at the end of the war, the, he was able to take with him 300 drawings um, that he had made during that time. And since we had been talking about, like, you know, in preparing for this, we were talking about the idea of humor as a, as a means of survival. Um, that that resonated with me, especially since Korish and when you were, uh, you know, to the audience there, you know, it takes a village to make these PowerPoint presentations and pull all this together. So everybody's got their assignments, go off, find us images for this, find us images for that. We assemble them in, in Dropbox and then start to build this thing. Korish had had this very humorous uh, picture of the, the cowboy and, and the horse, not too, not too impressed uh, with the cowboy singing and playing there. And um, the, the, just the juxtaposition of, of what I had found um, when uh, I was researching him um, just seemed apropos in, in general to some of the, the traumatic things that have happened in all of our lives and our abilities to find them humorous, but also in terms of Anthony's, um, some of the more difficult things he's encountered and the, the humor that we see day to day in, uh, in the cartoon series. Um, so that was, that was my thought there. Um, so now moving on, we find in Anthony that there were dual paths that he could go on. You know, was, was he going to be an artist? Was he going to be a writer? Um, and uh, he, he managed to do both. And so starting in 1964, uh, Anthony began drawing um, a weekly cartoon for the Sunday Telegraph um, called This Way Out. And this is on the, on the left here is an example of one of his early published cartoons. So you want to tell us how you got that job, Anthony, and, and what your experience was um, early in your career as a cartoonist? Yeah, I think I already had a, a writing job on it. My first job actually in journalism was, was on the Telegraph, on, on the Coghlan and the Sunday Telegraph. And as I recall, uh, that, that's, in fact, I'm sure that's how it happened. I also ran headfirst into the union movement uh, because I was told rather sternly that you were not supposed to write and draw to the same the union regulation. Um, so that was interesting. Um, yeah. So for the, it was against the union I mean, against the union policy that you, you know, couldn't. Was, thank God I draw a bit better. Oh, it was union union rules, you know. Union uh, rules. The meaning that. Meaning that their assumption, quite rightly, I guess, was if you had a job in one and then used that to get a job 
the other side, it meant you were doing somebody else out of a job. So I guess there was, I, I, saw, the, I saw the rationale behind it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, they decided to let me continue making my cartoons. Oh, we're thankful for that. The, so the one on the left here, um, it says, if, in case the print is too small for someone to read, it says, it's not that I object to a bugged bedroom, but I do wish that the microphones wouldn't talk to each other all night. It's pretty good. I'd totally forgotten that one. I might steal it and do it, it again. Is. I think you should. Uh, it's it's very funny. Oh. And you, it's it's you in 64. You, you had your sense of humor uh, sort of firmly established. Um, and the one yeah. on the right here, what, what was uh, Time and Tide? Time and Tide was, uh, the Spectator was the conservative, witty weekly. Um, the, st the Statesman was the, the liberal weekly. And uh, Time and Tide's long gone, I fear. It's owned by a clergyman, as I recall. I'm sorry, you, you cut out for a second, Anthony, if you could. Sure, I think I, where, where did I cut out? Um, um, just at what, what, what time and tide was exactly. It was a... It was, it was a, basically, um, its base was the Liberal Party, I suppose. Gotcha. And it was owned by a clergyman. It was nice, it was nice, pa it was nice paper. It was a weekly. Okay. And so this cartoon says, even if we don't go into the common market, sir, the engineers don't feel that we can possibly divert the other end to Canada. I'm not going to be reviving that joke. So <laughs> little time specific, um, but uh, fascinating, you know, to see the, uh, you know, topic, topical humor about the, the development of uh, the building of the channel. I like it. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's all too topical now because the common market was in a way that was the precursor to Europe which sadly we've left. I loathe Brexit. True. I, I am noticing that the your heads look like Easter Island, um, you know, uh, heads there, if anyone else sees that. Yeah, well, luckily I've stopped that. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a thing. Um, okay. And then, so your forays into art criticism. So two of your earliest um, uh, published works um, on writing about artists were on Bridget Riley, and Michelangelo Pizzoletto? How, yeah. how do those come uh, about? Pizzoletto is now having a, quite a comeback. He, that is painted on a mirror. And now he's now right now. I, I guess in a way, the interesting thing to me about this is that I was always, you know, I grew up in Chelsea, London, and I was friendly with artists. I grew up very much in part of that world. But writing about art seemed then a very special I covered the Biafra War, I covered stuff like that. And so, but a friend of mine acquainted me with the work of Bridget Riley. Who I, this could be a wrong memory, but I think she was still working at J. Walter Thompson then. My friend certainly was. I, was work, but I think almost the first piece I read about the art world, and then Pistoletto. But it, they were short pieces. I, I would, I, it was almost a... Um, it was, it, was, it was only when I got to New York that I went into lengthier pieces about the artwork already. Um, speaking of which, so you moved to you moved to New York in 1974, and Clay uh, Felker was involved somehow. How how did that come to be that you ended up here? Well, there, there's, a, there's a quite I think, a, yeah, this is a moment in my life. Um, my my dad was working in the UN. So I was in and out of New York quite a bit as a late teenager, you know, and earlier and early young adult. And I met Clay. I did a couple of pieces. I believe I did a piece for the New York magazine when it was still the supplement to the Herald Tribune. Could be wrong about that, but a very early I was doing pieces in New York. You know, because I was living in London. And back in London, I lived in this wonderful place to peasantry, a huge building on the King's Road, I had already mentioned in reference to Malcolm McLaren. You know, my next door neighbor was Jermaine Greer, all the guys, there were a lot of people. Dear friend, a fashion photographer on the other, uh, of the other door. And it was wonderful. But then it was just rather a New York story. A speculator bought the house. We were turfed out. And I went to a little party 
in London, who ran into Clay Coker, who I'd known from New York. I said, where are you? I've been looking for you. I said, Clay, well, I'm, I'm kind of sleeping around. I don't have anywhere right now. He gave me a ticket and a contract. That's how I'd moved to America. That was a really life-changing moment. We're certainly happy that that happened. Um, uh, so then, and I just, I love this picture of you from the 1970s. Do you want to work on the... Uh, Sorry? Hello? Korish. Gabrielle, do you need me to check the Wi-Fi? Yes. I, yeah, I'm cutting out a lot. <laughs> for those... <laughs> For those that don't know, Korish is in a bathtub. I think we, we covered that. Yeah. Um, so we'll move on for a second. Uh, yeah. So uh, two books of yours, uh, Bad <laughs> Dreams and The Last Party, very different um, subject matters um, based on real events. Uh, do you want to tell us about um, Bad Dreams, Anthony? Yes. Um, you know, like a, a lot of things, it. There was a lot of, are you getting me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of accident in it. On 80th Street and just a couple of blocks over on the top Lexington, there was a nice little restaurant called Nicola's, run by the former maitre d' at Elaine's. And it was a lovely little place. And um, one of the people, I met this, guy there called Buddy Jacobson, who owned the building opposite. I've also met a young guy there called Jack Tupper. And Buddy also owned a model agency. And his girlfriend was a model, Melanie, Melanie Kane. And um, she, you know, kind of had, had it with Buddy. I can't see anything, I'm looking at we see you, Anthony, but we also hear the feedback from okay. Porsche's computer now. Anyway, and um, so he had Jack murdered. And um, I knew pretty well. And one of the group, somebody who lived in Buddy's building was closely connected with a, with a family that or what I saw, an organization, shall we say, that ran hashish out of Kennedy Airport. And Buddy tried to use this to, um, you know, to, to, to sow doubt in the minds of the jury and all of that. Unsuccessfully, there were, there were an American, Irish American group I became extremely friendly with, very friendly. And because of that, somebody who was not actually an organization contacted me and said, would I like to go with him to Lebanon? That's how the whole Lebanon thing happened. And said he was going to write, he's going to unmask some major heroin dealers in Lebanon. Would I like to write about it? Sure. And I got a, I got a contract by British Esquire, from British Esquire, went over. And I discovered this guy, the head of this family was not in the heroin business at all. He was a hashish dealer. And I had no moral problem with hashish. So I told Donnie who I wasn't going to have anything to do with it. It's a complicated, then they discovered, they knew by now that Donnie who was working for DEA, and so they kind of kept him, I guess kidnapped him, but not me. Then I decided I had to get him out. Anyway, that's how the whole Lebanon thing began. And what, what year was this taking place? Um, I, I, either the late 80s or the early, because I, it's early 90s, I think. I mean, I could easily find out, but I don't know. It doesn't come to me. Gotcha. So then, so before that... While uh, the war, while the, the war stopped in the late 90s, it was while the war was still lasting away. Uh, um, and so you wrote The Last Party later, but obviously your experiences... Well, what, the Last Party is a totally different. That's about New York's nighttime. Sure, sure, yes. That's the this this yeah. great pendulum swing of, of life. Um, so how soon into... Uh, Studio 54 opening, where did you attend? I'd become, again, through New York Magazine, I'd become friendly with Steve Rubell. And um, I was there really early on. And, and, um, and then, um, I don't know, I, I think I proposed it's an idea, the book. 
because that whole, I mean, Sheila um thanks in part to Entrega and thanks to the documentary, there are slightly false histories grown up. Studio 52 was a wonderful club, but it was not the only club. You know, there were, there were a great club called Xenon, which was very much a competitor with, the, with Studio. And of course, a completely different crowd, there was a mud club, which was downtown. So it was a very wonderful, multifarious world, sure. which I knew pretty well. And that's what the book was about. And yeah. I did dear Frank Olaf Weinstein, who ran the world sometimes known as the end of the world, which was down on Avenue C. And um, again, a totally different world. That's where a movie that ah, I, I saw Bowie. Bowie gave a performance with, with a group, a short-lived group called Tin Man there. It was a really incredible club. It was not, Studio 54 was not the only game in town by any manner of means. That's New York for you, you know. There's, there's by the eighties, I was in high school, going to all of those clubs, and and uh, we had we had uh, at least a dozen of them. Yeah, of course, one could a whole. I would say six figures every figure, over well over a hundred thousand people would wander around every night, you know, going from club to club, and then the after hours thing began. Suddenly, hell is two in the morning. You don't want to go home, and go to bed, and so the whole after hours thing began. In fact, Arthur Weinstein Borders began that with a place called the Jefferson. A lot of those after hours clubs were in the Chelsea district, and some of them are now where they're very serious art galleries. One of Arthur's clubs was called the Continental. I think that's where Pace is now. Okay, so, um, so what's happening now? So we have been um, running a, a project uh, together for the last, uh, how many days is it, Donovan? When we were on 90, 90. 94 yeah. or three today, I think. Today's the 93rd day, something like that. So we started this project on election day and the idea was to sort of kind of take a moment um, to, uh, you know, continue to reintroduce Anthony's cartoons um, to people and to find new audiences also on social media for the cartoons um, in, in what was a play on the idea of the first hundred days of a presidency. So what, what could possibly have happened from election day um, to a hundred days later, um, which would include the inauguration of, of a president, we, we didn't know who, um, but we thought something interesting might, might take place and that Anthony's cartoons um, would be a welcomed humorous respite from the struggles of the pandemic and quarantine and political unrest. And that turned out to be uh, uh, it, true that it was going to be an interesting time. So um, I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, sharing your work um, with the, the public during this time. And it, with the stimulus was this cartoon, The American Scream. What was um, your thought process uh, when, you, when, you first, when you first made this? Because you, you make these cartoons over and over again. When, when a topic um, or subject matter strikes you, you, you might make it a, a dozen times to perfect the writing or, or certain lines. Um, so when you first made uh, a depiction of, of the scream, and labeled it the American Scream, what was going through your head? In that case, I, you know, it's hard for me to, I love the, the, the story of the, how Munch came up with the Scream is extraordinary. And it, it, the origins of the Scream are just fascinating in themselves. I also think it's a great image. It's one of the most, um, so I, 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 can't, I can't give a specific coherent answer to that. I, I'm in a constant state of, interior monologue, examination of stuff, analysis, and, you know, ideas just pop up like uh, toast out of a toaster, you know. Um, they're not all good ones, but some, some work. Sometimes and, um, the toast I mean, is I don't, I don't specifically remember how the American scream rang up. I, I know that, I think, somebody close to him committed suicide on that cliff close to where the scream is, where he had the experience with the scream, which was, he had a vision there. Eckeberg, 
What's the name of that cliff? No. That town, side of town. Um, it is one of the most iconic images, you know, in uh, the you know twentieth century art history. Um, and often stolen painting, by the way. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, and the first work on paper to sell for over a hundred million dollars. Interesting anecdote about the scream. Um, well, I, love, I love just a sort of form of cartooning and um, it, it's, I think, curiously neglected. And right now, um, one can say, say a lot in cartooning. Of course. Um, has there been a time in your life? Uh, so but we'll get back to that in a second. So the other things happening now, um, page six, um, you know, did, ran a story, gave you a little love for uh, um, the, the books that you have had out um, about cartooning and the series that we're engaged in now um, and the, some signings that you've been doing. And then also in, in keeping up with the antics, you had an experience at uh, Art Miami uh, this year, this past year, 2020, um, which folks didn't even necessarily think that uh, Art Miami Week would happen, and yet you brought you brought some energy and enthusiasm to it. Can you tell us how this came about? I have to tell you, I, I this is not my proudest moment. I don't think people should be climbing over artworks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> mind you, that is a, a metal piece and practically impenetrable. I think it's probably so. It's well, there was no risk of damaging it. I don't think it's a great idea. I don't know. It's just, um, I also, I, I'm sometimes extremely impulsive and um, don't always control my impulses, I'm afraid. Gotcha. Well, it's a nice dichotomy there with the page six doesn't necessarily always highlight people's greatest experiences in life. So for them to uh, have acknowledged um, the success of, of your cartooning and your art career, and then um, mere uh, days later to have the opportunity to see you on top of a statue. I'm sure the, the guys at page six were appreciative of that. And I'm um, delighted you give me the opportunity to say that, sorry folks, I didn't really mean it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, well, um, I, uh, it's, it's a unique experience. I think it makes for a great cartoon. Um, I would love to see you um, depict uh, one of your uh, very lifelike characters on top of a golden horse. All right now we're going to look at some uh, close look at some cartoons. I don't know who chose these with Corish, Donovan, Anthony, who said? Not me. I didn't show them. I think these um, ones were mine. That must mean that they're yours. So um, what are what are your thoughts? Why do you choose these? unless you didn't choose them and they're the ones that are on the PowerPoint slide. Oh no, I chose these. Okay. And when I was talking to Anthony about his sort of process, he said he just gets in, you know, data, <laughs> sense, sense input and the gears get churning subconsciously and then things sort of like pop out of there. Like maybe that's part of your impulsive uh, demeanor, the spontaneity, the, the cartoons. Uh, I thought I, these are two of my favorite ones in the series. I like this. Sorry, I misspoke. Apparently, it actually is the end of the world because it kept like uh, as 2020, you know, <laughs> wound to a close there. It sort of felt like any number of events you were having that, oh, maybe this is it, you know? <laughs> so I thought, and sorry, the timeliness of the series, this one was uh, at the top uh, for me. Also, the narrative quality of uh, the cartoons, I think, comes through on this one because cartoons are weird because you have to almost get them like instantly. You can't, uh, you can sit and ponder them, but when they really like hit is when it all comes together and you synthesize it like right, right away. But there are, they are narrative and they do have a story. So the way that they condense that narrative quality into like that instant of recognition something comes from nothing, uh, so to speak. I had to pick this one because I'm, you know, nothingness philosopher. Um, so yeah, nothing is inexhaustible. It never runs out. I was like, oh, it's a, you're a moment of Zen here uh, from Anthony. Uh, so. Thanks, thanks for that, Donovan. Mm -hmm. um, and then these, these Korsh, this is these, your choice. I'm, I'm going to begin with, uh, with the second one, with Dead End, because of what Donovan just said, that nothingness never runs out. I'm, I'm used to thinking of Anthony um, as my clever friend who 
always has these great one-liners and, and he sees something funny to say about a situation or people. And uh, unlike those other ones, this one requires a little looking at it. It's bright red and, and this white writing on it. It's just so appealing, like a piece of candy. And you're thinking, yum. And then it says dead end. <laughs> <laughs> it just plays with your imagination so much and, and it makes a dead end look like such a wonderful thing. Um, so it makes me laugh over and over again. Um, and then going to the first one, half full, half empty, half witted. Um, I've always you know, called myself a glass half full kind of a guy. And um, I also love to play with words. So this is, I'm, I'm a great punster. And uh, this is a great pun. It just made me laugh. And I, 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 just, I love looking at it. And, and, and of course, it's a cartoon. So the expressions on the glasses faces make it that much better. It's not just words, but, but they're words with, with expressions. Thanks. Thanks, Gorish. I like the color. These two would look really good together for the, the art collector in the audience this <laughs> evening. I've, I've not seen these two matched up as a diptych, but um, I think uh, we could uh, mat and frame these for, for a collector and uh, they really they really look wonderful together. Put them next uh, to your candy bowl. Yes. Um, okay, and then uh, Anthony, I think these were the ones that you, you chose. Um, so you wanna tell us about these? Well, so the main thing is, is I, 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 the point I'd like to make is that I, I, just, I feel awkward talking about my own work in a way, um, but I'll do it. Um, many cards, including some really great ones, are basically, like Charles Adams, have one joke. I mean, not one joke, one situation, they have one, they have one context. Um, it happens that... Um, I have, I can, I have different kinds of humours. I'm interested in words, I can make word jokes, I'm interested in behaviour, I can work with behaviour. I can, you know, different kind of things. And so it's hard for me to treat, for instance, the first one, that is so rude, you've got, that, that is obviously a behavioural. Uh, the other one, I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of drawings about the art world. And these are more, you know, observational about the way artists think. Obviously, rather sarcastic representation sometimes. But, um, and for instance, the last one, Dead End, is part of a series about gravestones called Lucky Stiffs. But that's the only one where the gravestone is made out of bricks. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's enough for me. Um, so what's next? I love this um, T-shirt that you, this, well, this cartoon, you have the future, not my problem. Um, and so uh, a lot of people have expressed more and more interest in um, different kinds of, of merchandise as the cartoon series is becoming more popular. And uh, we use merch uh, in a um, humorous and colloquial manner, but um, using your cartoons if, to make artworks of different media is certainly something that you are engaged in and, and continue to want to be engaged in further, uh, be it neon works, um, mirrors. Uh, Korsh recently curated a group show that you were in, and it was, uh, I, I think it was the first time, correct, that the, your work was um, put on mirrors, and that was great, and people loved them and uh, bought them, and were excited to make more. Um, in different shapes and sizes, featuring different cartoons. And uh, you're also starting to, or I don't know, starting you have in, in the past also, but you're making some new sculpture now um, that involves the, the cartoons. What was the, the, t the name of the kind of sculpture you're calling it? You know, I've not thought of a good name. They're, they're not so much sculptures as found objects, which I can, which I can see in a... In a I do. You have to, you are, you don't have them. Do you have them here? Or, I, I don't. I don't. Well, I have a picture on my phone, which I did, okay. but I don't think that I could. Okay. Uh, um, I love the idea of. I don't think I invented this. So Saul Steinberg used to use collage very interestingly in some of his cartoons, and and he used things like stamps. I, I love the idea of bringing in things from the real world and then exploiting them for humorous and satirical ends. You've been very successful at that, Anthony. So 
I, I like the name you came up with, sculptunary. I yeah, but they're really more found objects than sculpture, and so I'm not sure about sculptures. Um, thinking about it. Okay, so now we're going to show some photos. We asked, uh, we reached out to friends of yours. So and, my um, friend, can we go back? Because that is my, can we go back to the last photograph? Uh, sure. Because that is Lorraine Leckie, who is a wonderful singer. And she, she's, she created, she turns on my rhymes. And so we have a nice little album. And what also, the funny thing about that, she's wearing clothes, which spoils it. But there's a famous, um, photograph of um, a, a gal playing chess naked with Marcel Duchamp, which is a classic, which was taken when uh, for Marcel Duchamp's first show in, in LA. It's a, the gal looking at the guy, you know, the older guy. So it waved. Um, so that's that. Now, but Lorraine is at, uh, I'll sing her, it's called, uh, our little album is called, um, ah, wasn't called that. <laughs> That's a, that would be a good title. Um, I have it somewhere. Uh, rudely interrupted. Rudely interrupted. Correct. 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 She's a fabulous singer, and um, she's got a great little band called the Demons. Wonderful. Okay, we're gonna keep going yeah. with this. I have uh, no idea how long this runs, and uh, so. Many people have sent uh, photos and we didn't have the time to credit everyone with, with this part of it. Um, but when we- That was Ronnie Anderson, that's Anthony. Oh, that's my little, one of my boxing, yeah, yeah, oh yeah. That, that's, that's, uh, I think I'm, that's not, I think, yeah. Notice I'm wearing white t-shirts a lot of the time. This, uh, uh, Hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I, my mind goes. This is Brenda Slomani. Yeah. Other yeah. she's been making wonderful paintings of people wearing masks. And this is a boxing match. I was until recently. I, in fact, I had I had a boxing match and a few birthdays before, and I wanted to have one this birthday, but they said, "Okay, I can do it as long as we could have social distancing." And <laughs> I thought a boxing match with social distancing was quite a good comic concept. I like that. Long distance boxing. I've never seen that. I, I don't remember that photograph. Lord, I love it. What the devil has that come from? Lord. This is Ronnie Anderson, who's got a tremendous gallery I've done on Maiden Lane called Anderson Contemporary. Uh, a beautiful note from, from uh, Tamara. Tamara. Oh, I know, I know. She sent me a copy. Wow, a lot of these pictures I've never seen or haven't seen so long ago that I could get them. You and Linus. So that's, that's Linus, who I'm renting space from in his studio. Now, looks yeah. like another birthday celebration there. Yeah. That's one of them. Let's see if we can read some comments while we're at it with the chat box. Yeah. Um, and if Shay is saying she took the picture of you with Tamara. Yeah. Well, that's nice. She's been saying hello all along. I hear my looking really like a humorist, right? <laughs> I look like I just told a really bad joke. Um, that's a nice art piece up there. What is that? Oh, this is one of my, that's one of my prints, by the way. Yeah, I love these. Yeah. That was at Albers' studio that... Uh... Barbara Rosenthal. Oh, yes, the writer. Absolutely. Barbara again. Barbara and, and Marcia Mar Mar Resnick. Great for fabulous punk photographer. Fabulous. Or is that is that as far as we've gone here? Did I or did I pause it? Okay, that's that's that. And okay. then we are moving on to why doesn't the okay? So now oh now Anthony, do you wanna this is the premiere, I think, of this video. We can't watch the whole thing, but we're gonna watch a few minutes of it. What yeah. are we about to see? Well, you're gonna, well, okay, there's a story here. Um, after my stabbing, which we haven't discussed really, I was, um, what year was it? 96. I think it's all the case. Well, somebody, this guy who tried to rape somebody in my place, um, or planned to, not tried to. 
ended up stabbing me 14 times. So then after that, I thought, well, I'm 59. I was lucky, I got in with a shillelagh. But I better have started. So I started physical training. I started doing weights. And I've been upping it ever since. And I, I started doing, I love dancing anyway. So I started doing a rigid 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just dancing to rock and roll or mixture, uh, my own mixtape. And then when the COVID happened, I went up to 60 minutes. I don't do it every morning because it's time consuming and sometimes I'm on deadlines. I do it at least three or four or five times a week. I did this morning, a 60 minute dance to rock and roll, not only rock and roll. I have, for instance, Noel Coward's There's Bad Times Are Coming, which bleeds into Elvis Presley doing um, Jailhouse Rock. Um, uh, Pebbles Russell wrote a very nice message. Happy birthday, Anthony. I miss you so, so much. If only we could have an evening of hilarity at the Slipper Room or Sway or literally anywhere below 14th, uh, 14th Street. I love you so, so much. Um, very sweet message from Pebbles. Yeah, I love Pebbles. I, I, I'm not sure Sway is still around. Our uh, good friend, Ben Afshe, uh, wrote in that the stabbing in her memory took place after a Greg Quietek opening at Stux Gallery. Yeah, yeah. In 1994. 94. That was the year that, um, yeah, I was still going to let. Well, see which one of you is right. Sorry? What point? I said, we'll have to see which one of you is right. Okay. Um, so, this is a video that was shot by uh, Mark Brady. Mark, Mark Brady. Mark Brady. Um, and edited uh, by. No, this is I have to tell the story because it's brilliant. Please tell the story. Yeah. Originally, I did the dance with my, my, my playlist, which was very carefully assembled. I began with um, all kinds of great songs in it. Um, uh, upside Down, um, Tainted Love, you know, some of my favorite songs, including a wonderful song by the Australian group, uh, Midnight Oil, Beds Are Burning, which, they, which was a hit in Australia a few years before Australia actually was burning. But uh, then somebody told me, by the way, you have to pay for all these. I said, what? I hadn't, I, I hadn't read Tango with the rights business. So these brilliant musicians remade a music tape that makes it look like I'm dancing to it. In fact, probably more accurately as I was probably dancing to original rock and roll. So. I, I, I'm much in their debt. So it was uh, M. Henry Jones and Daniel. M. Henry Jones is an artist. Henry introduced me as musicians. Uh, Mark Brady, um, Stuart Art, and um, Daniel Cooper. Yeah, D Daniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel was the arranger, and Stuart uh, Stuart composed the brand new music. And this is it. Okay, so we're gonna watch a few moments of this. Yes, you don't expect to don't expect Rudolph Nuri. You're all welcome to dance.
that is beguiling. Um, there are a couple of panelists who said they're dancing with you now. Wonderful. wonderful. You got a lot of love in the comments there. Yeah, people are very <laughs> happy about it. Um, Coco's dancing, very nice, good dance. That, that's, Linus's, that's Linus's studio. And what's great about dancing there is people get bored of looking at me, they can look at the arts, which is perfect. Oh. Very nice. Um, so wonderful. Well, I uh, look forward to dancing to the full hour at some point. I feel like I should incorporate that into my daily routine, at least the 13 minutes to kind of, kind of get the power uh, workout in that way. Um, we're going to uh, make that do that. Um, Thank you for being so gentle, everybody. Oh, people loved it. Um, hold on, I have to... Do we want to open it up? Yeah. So um, then just uh, as, as we're coming to the, the close of the formal part of the program, because this is all formal, everyone, just, this is the formal program. Um, uh, I wanted to let you know that if you're interested in more information about available works of Anthony's or other artists that Philosophy uh, represents and features, um, you can reach out to us at collecting at philosophyarts.com. Anthony's cartoons, uh, the, the 100 cartoons that are in the series uh, the American Scream we've been featuring are available for sale. Um, so please reach out to us for that. Um, and our website is www.philosophyarts.com. Uh, Anthony series um, is available also on, you can check it out on Artsy, um, on a, at our, our Artsy page. And um, so every time we do one of these episodes, um, we we are very well aware that we cannot even begin to scratch the surface about the you know unique and complex lives of the artists that we feature or fully look at their their herbs. Um, so we leave people with hopefully more questions than answers through some philosophical investigation. Um, so it's it's kind of our theme to to leave you on a question. Although I believe we have another slide after this this time. Um, but so Donovan, our our philosophical question uh, this evening. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, just to uh, something to take with you and ponder, since this has been a very serious production, uh, is can you be happy without laughter? So uh, I think it's interesting to think about the connection between happiness and laughter and whether happiness is something that happens, that you feel happy right now and you are happy, or is it like what Aristotle says, where he doesn't think you can be happy until you are able to look at the whole life and um, see everything and it's like uh, in its complete completion. So. Anyway, something to think about as you uh, go about your, your day. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that, Donovan. And uh, finally, we were very uh, pleased that Anthony made uh, a self-portrait um, for, for us to, to promote this event for. And so we, we uh, end with this, um, uh, this image. Anthony, happy birthday. If everybody has uh, uh, something uh, to drink that they can raise or, or just raise, raise a hand up. Uh, virtually. Uh, Anthony, to, to your health, happy birthday. We love you very much. Um, and it's been a great uh, pleasure to celebrate you this evening. Thanks to everybody, invisible and invisible. Cheers.